Oh, happy day to you. I am Jen Yates. You're locked on to Generation Nation right here on LRS102.com. And I'm super pumped. I'm always super pumped. We've got Andy Ramser up in the LRS102 studios. Andy, how are you doing today? Awesome. Thank you. I'm so pumped to have you. I'm always excited to have guests in the studio, especially creative artists. That's where my soul is. So we're going to talk everything about your music career, your record, Mad Luck. Right? Which yes. is a cool name for a band, by the way. Thank you. Yeah, and all the projects that you've got coming up, all the gigs you got coming up. Let's just start by saying hello, all of our listeners. Glad you're tuned in. Um, we are broadcasting live downtown on East Broadway at the Launch Louisville Studios. I met you officially, I think, for the first time outside on Logan Street. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was it. Yeah. Yeah, parallel parking. Hey, I did a pretty good job. I, was, I slid right in there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's always nice when you can parallel park perfectly the first time. Um, I once dated a girl who could not parallel park, and she would always make me get out of the car and get in the driver's seat and parallel park her car. <laughs> it's crazy, isn't it? High maintenance. Bougie. That's what bougie is right there. That's bougie. I learned Yeah, Uh, we've been talking all things records and all things uh, creative, uh, you know, everything basically concerning music. But let's start by telling our listeners a little bit about yourself. How did you get your start in music? Like, did you start as a kid? Were you surrounded by a musical family? When did you first pick up an instrument? I um, have just always loved music, but my start in it actually was from my career in advertising. I've worked in media all and right yay yay <laughs> so much fun yeah um, advertising but i used to go to concerts all the time from getting tickets from radio stations mm-hmm. that i was working with and i would stand there watching the performer on stage and think man i don't want to be watching this i want to be doing it yeah and i know so that's a just, true musician right there yeah it's really hard i try to tell people this all the time it's really hard for people to understand that when you're a musician it's hard to go out and watch other people because yeah. you want to be on stage doing it yeah which we always want to support we've got a great supportive system here musically in louisville kentucky um but obviously uh it just kills you when you're going and watching and i've been there multiple times and gone man i wish i could be playing that right now well i had to have a couple drinks before trying out for my first band because I'd never, <laughs> ever <laughs> thought I that I would be there, but I'd, yeah. I had to push myself to do it. Um, so there was an ad in the Leo for a female mm-hmm. rock singer. Cool. And that was my first experience. I didn't make it. I had, oh, you didn't? I had no experience, but it got me connected. Um, I was a runner up okay. that way. The girl that so got you, the gig. So you lost the audition. Yes. Yeah. Is the girl who still got the gig around <laughs> <I did>. here? <laughs> well. We don't have to name drop. I'm just no, curious. Yeah. I won't drop yeah. any names. Uh-huh. I understand. So, I've um, lost some auditions in my day, though. So it's just part of the routine, I feel like. I didn't take it too much to heart. Yeah. I kind of gave myself props for even having the nerve to do it when I had zero experience. So yeah. um, she was very talented and, and got the gig. And then they were you know impressed with me being um being a first timer having Mm -hmm. the stage presence that i did they got me connected to a couple other guys that i started a band with and that ended up being 0.10 okay we had a good six-year run we were playing one zero so it's okay so let me just say i was like is that a rolling paper it (laughs) used no it used to be cool okay okay. it used to be cool because 0.10 used to be the alcohol limit oh and then they changed it to 0.08 and it screwed everything up oh yeah been there done that (laughs) we'd already you know established all our stuff yeah i feel you it was what it was (laughs) oh okay i get it now so it's the legal limit of alcohol intoxication basically that you could blow before going to jail yes yeah until they until they change Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I didn't think about that, but smart. Yeah, yeah, very smart. Yeah. So we played the circuit and kind of built our way up. And all along, you know, I've always written. And I think a lot of um, what I would write would be more towards poetry. Yeah. But well, that's what lyrics are. Lyrics are poetry. That's exactly. what I found out. Yeah. Um, and I used to write a lot of poetry and say that I didn't write lyrics. And then all of a sudden those poetry, those poems turned into song lyrics. Most so certainly. I write, um, I try to write every day as much as possible. Sometimes you can't help but do it. Yeah. So. I did want to tell you though, 
kudos to you because I have uh, done a lot of awesome stuff in my career. I've been in books. Uh, I've been in films. Um, you know, I've I toured the world, and I I can still come back and a cover band tell me that I'm not good enough for them. You know oh, what I'm wow. saying? Yeah. So uh, at this point, I'm just like I don't mm. think I believe. That. Yeah, I didn't believe <laughs> it either, and I kind of laugh at them now. But I'm like, if if they ever were to ask me again, I'm two million a gig now. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I won't say no, but I, I'm too expensive for you all. Yeah. Just because I thought the disc was kind of, mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there's too much fun in writing and creating your own exactly. stuff anyway. So. so then I just write, write, wrote songs about them. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's how it works. Fuel it. Wait. <laughs> Where's my rim shot? Ah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so anyway, good good for you for uh, not letting that, like, burst your bubble and stop it, and you just plowed right on through it. That's yeah. how you got to roll, yeah. Yeah, and it got me used to being on stage and performing, and um, all the while I was writing my own stuff, not really knowing when and how that was going to come to fruition. But. Yeah. But now look at you. You brought me in a record, which I, I love. You look so cute on the little cover. I just love it. You're in a, uh, if you haven't seen it, it's called Mad Luck is the name of the band. And Sweeter Now is the name of the record. And she's standing there with a knife and a cake. Is that a knife in your hand? That's a knife. Yeah, but it looks like a knife. But you I don't know if it's icing from the cake or blood. <laughs> that. <laughs> Is dum, the question. Dum, dum. Right. Ooh, that's kind of interesting. Yeah. Well, and tell us a little bit about the record, just because I, I think it's fascinating. I love to write myself. I love a concept record. It's kind of a concept record, you said. Yes and no. Um, the the uh, album title, Sweeter Now, that is kind of where the whole concept for the artwork and um, the idea with the knife and everything came from is so. the yeah and when i see this i think hmm i wonder if this chick on the cover is sweeter now or not so sweet because she's holding the I knife i don't know if i was ever <laughs> that sweet. you're always a, a bad girl yeah i pretend to yeah be. well i've been there too <laughs> <laughs> i think people know the real truth though. yeah but I'm anyway we're gonna sweet. Yeah, you seem pretty sweet. Um, we're going to spin some tracks off of this later on for, right. for our listeners here at LRS 102. But uh, I just love the artwork and very, I could tell you did uh, graphic and like art. art. Um, what'd you say? You're the creative I had, artist, basically. I had basically, the whole idea for it. Yeah, um, the artistic actually, director, per se. Now I've got to think here. Uh, Tom, 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 Tom Anderson. I worked with at one of the agencies I was at. He was a graphic designer. He actually designed our um, logo. And then I had him do the artwork on the back, which is supposed to be like cake icing. Yeah, I can totally tell that. The piping is fantastic. And then Jeremy (laughs) Kramer did the uh, photography for it. He's um, near Cincinnati on that border, and he's a fantastic photographer. Got exactly what I wanted out of the idea. Where did you get that dress is what I want to know. I think I got it on Etsy. It's a little apron. It's like a custom apron. Oh, it's an apron. It looks like a dress (laughs) from the way... uh, or is it you're wearing a dress under it? I'm trying nope. to figure that out. Nope. Okay. <laughs> nope. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> That's awesome. Just well, an apron. very cool. Yeah, just very cool. I love that. Uh, and we're going to spend some some stuff off of that. So you finally got your experience on stage a little bit, and then what happened after that? Because how did it lead up to Mad Luck? Well, we did do a couple original songs with Point One Zero, mm-hmm. um, and in the meantime. Sean, who is the guitarist that I work with in both my acoustic Mm -hmm. duo and Mad Luck, um, he joined the band as our lead guitarist, and um, he and I started writing some original music that I was doing on my own, kind of off to the side. He just got the style that I was going after, and it just, it, it was a perfect partnership. Um, I would come to him with ideas and he would start playing around in, on his guitar and I would be like, that's exactly what I wanted. That's yeah. what I was thinking in my head. And so I, you had that magic creative spark with him. Yeah. Are and you still playing with him? He's yes. in both bands now or mm-hmm. both groups? Okay. Yep. 
seven years in. Wow! So, congrats to you. Thank um, you. We were just talking about you know I just lost one of my one of my great bass players of twelve years, and um, I talk often about this with my connection with Beverly McClellan, um, as well as a ton of other people. I've worked with so many musicians over the years and done so many cool projects. Um, it's always hard to find that creative spark. And I'm always constantly searching for it because I, as a producer and a writer and a creative artist, am always looking for new artists to collaborate with because I do believe um, music is about the collaborational aspect. The key is, say, you and I collaborate, then your goal is to get my crowd with, on your page right. and vice versa. And that's how you build your audience is by working with other people. And also you gain experience that way as well right. for, via playing and you learn something and whatnot. But I'm always looking for that creative magical spark creatively. Maybe we have it, Jim. Yeah, maybe we might. <laughs> we can try it. We're going to rap together. <laughs> We're going to rap together. I am down. Play. I am down to rap with you. I Trust me on that. Um, and I have a solo record coming out pretty soon too called Sweet. Her Street that's got a lot of tracks and I'm pretty much playing a character in those saying things that I might not say in my everyday life. It's kind of like the, you know, the f the female Eminem ripping everybody kind of a oh, new one. I gotta hear this. Yeah. yeah. Well, you're gonna love Bougie because it's a diss track. <laughs> and I'm <laughs> rapping. So I never really uh, focused on my vocals. I have literally played almost every instrument. I'm not very good at strings, but I can play like rhythm guitar, basic first positions. I was a woodwind player, clarinet and saxophone. I played marimbas and did pit. I played drum set my entire life. That was my forte but the one thing I never focused on was vocals and but I did radio for years and people my entire life kept saying to me your voice is so awesome your voice is so it's awesome it's unique and that's what I I think the world needs I agree yeah so Sometimes I didn't, you can't tell the difference between who's on the radio yeah so. exactly exactly and I always get sir which cracks me up every time I'm in a drive through they're like thank you sir pull around or if I'm on the phone with somebody they're like thank you sir and I'm like you're welcome I just stopped correcting them and then you pull up and they're like oh well they don't know what to think of me <laughs> I've had people actually stand right in front of me boobs out and all and go hey sir you know, they just, I, I think I confuse people gender wise for some reason. I always have, you know. I'm like, look, I'm just as confused as you are. It. I do have fun with it. I'm like, look, I'm just as confused as you are. Call me whatever. My name is Jen Yates, <laughs> you know. And, and then we go from there. But the last two records that I did, uh, I finally started doing vocals on myself. I worked with a Juilliard vocal grad opera singer. Oh, wow. Um, we did an electronic record. It was my first electronic because I had done rock and roll and blues and country and all these other styles, Americana, um, but I had not touched electronic. And I had some of the earliest electronic drums from a kid, you know. So I was always like, hey, let's do this, and then maybe I can rap. Well, she was like, man, you've got a great vocal. You know, this was coming from a, a real pro vocally who taught vocals and then when I met Beverly McClellan she said the same thing and we started blending our voices and she was like wow you have this real bass you know deep thing that goes underneath mine that just blends so well so Bev would write and then she would leave me in a room and go okay now you write your verse here and I want you to do a chorus there and I'll see you in a couple of hours figure it out you know and so she made me do vocals basically well Sean has made me um, kick it in with some guitar. He bought me a guitar for my birthday a couple years ago, and I just know some of the basic chords. Yeah. I avoid the B chord. Oh, yeah. The, it with a passion. Everybody hates the... Uh, I love the way it sounds. The bar chords. <laughs> it's a bar chord. That's why it's so hard, right? Yeah. So, you know what, though? I will say this. Mark Barnes was in here, and he's a great lead guitar player. He's just a great player all the way around. He plays bass and everything else. I said the same thing to him. I said, Mark, I love to play all my first position chords, but I was like, that B, man, that B, because it's a bar chord. And he mm -hmm. goes, well, look at it like this. The frets at the top of the guitar are stretched out a lot farther. They start to get smaller as they go down the neck. So those chords that you first start out on, those bar chords, are the hardest ones to learn. Once you learn those and you slot them on down the neck, it gets easier. And I was like, what a great concept. Yeah. And he's right, you know. Yeah, yeah and he, uh, I think he's taught a little bit on the side here and there, you know, and whatnot. But anyway, great way to look at it. Those yeah. are going to be the hardest, that B chord. Yeah, so the first album... We collaborated a lot. I would write most of the lyrics and melodies, and and uh, he would help me put the song together and come up with all of the arrangements. And then on the second album, it's going to be a lot different. We've been working on it for a couple of years now, but it's because of the distance. Mm -hmm. um, he lives in Nashville, so um, 
we work out of his studio. We're at so Nashville. I'm a big fan. East Nashville. East Nashville. That's the place to be right Have now. Have you girl. been to Pharmacy Burger? He's right around the corner. No, so. but my my ex girlfriend and her husband own Brothers Burger down there okay. in East Nashville. Um, they have a big burger shop. But I've spent a lot of time in East Nashville. I played the Five Spot not too long ago. Yeah, yeah. I like that place. Yeah, uh, just did a record out of there. So you and I've got a documentary film coming out on women drum set players. What don't you do? Too? <laughs> I do. I call myself a gen of all trades. I'm a gen of all trades. I do a little bit of everything. Drums are my main forte, but production I'm really good at. Um, radio, <laughs> I'm back in radio. Anyway, uh, I did um, a documentary film coming out down there in September around my birthday, around the 20th. Very cool. Yeah, my birthday is the 18th, so they're gonna they're gonna premiere it. And Todd Shuckerman of Styx, uh, the drummer of Chicago, as well as all these famous drummers, uh, Jared Folk, and all these people who teach these online drum lessons they're all going to be there they're rolling at the red carpet it's going to be awesome nice. so anyway we should hook up in nashville at some point oh yeah i'm yeah. down there every other weekend cool well then maybe so. we'll come up with some raps and hey get her done you got it <laughs> i have one rap on that first oh album. you do well i'll have to check I it say, out i'm gonna say rap loosely because okay. uh my version of loose rap is good is <laughs> wait where's my laughter probably not. loose is okay all right uh -huh. hey now I know, I know. <laughs> well, here's the cool thing about LRS. We literally can say anything we want. And I have a little ding button here in case you cuss. Oh, I've um, been so ladylike. Yeah. So well, far. You, if you want to <laughs> keep it ladylike, you can do that. But if you want to get a little rowdy, you're welcome to do that. Because what right. we do here is we have a swear jar. Anytime we cuss, we donate it to the swear jar. And at the end of the month, we donate that to charity so uh -huh. that we cuss for Maybe a I'll good start dropping reason. The <laughs> Feel free. For Feel a good free. Cause. Yeah. So anyway, uh, yeah. So you do you you mainly sing, but you do have a rap. Tell me a little bit about the second record because I'm more I'm more curious about that, the one that's coming out. Well, that's that's one where uh, Sean, like I was saying, Sean has been pushing me to write more uh, in terms of playing the guitar and being able to. When I come to him with a song idea, mm -hmm. it's always me trying to explain what I hear. Yeah. And I mean. I literally sing the guitar. So okay. I'll be like, That's nair, 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 you know, <laughs> do, 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 he gets do, 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 do. it. <laughs> he has a way of translating it. I don't know how he does it. That's but good. There have been two songs um, that I've written where I could actually present it to him on guitar and sing it from beginning to end. And, cool. you know, for a lot of people, they're like, ooh, woo, woo, big deal. But for me, like, it was, it was a new... Um, a new venture a new goal yeah. Yeah, that new goal. i achieved right. and so uh there's a song called who we are and a song called flex and strut that i um actually flex and wrote. strut sounds fun you oh, yodel cool. wait you yodel is that what you just said oh no oh i thought you said you yodeled i don't know if i can yodel. i was like oh yeah that's a fine art i the, the last record i just <laughs> did you want to try but not live yeah don't try it live it. yeah <laughs> just in case no i just did a, that americana record and that chick yodeled and that's what sold me on working with her because oh, yeah. i heard her yodel yodel and i had never worked with a yodeler but she told me that uh at vocally she had to practice for hours and hours at certain kind of technique vocally yeah so i love a yodeler especially the one on the prices right that climbs a little mountain and yodels oh, and like ooh, 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 yeah see my my <laughs> only experience is singing the lonely goat song from sound of music all right huge sound of music band. yeah heck yeah i'm a big musical fan done a lot of musicals so. in my day yeah that's super rad well congrats to you on the new record and uh, any idea when it will be out are you still in the production phases of it or we um we have a lot left to do so we have all of the songs and we're currently at 12 okay. um which is well, a little ambitious to get completed mm -hmm. when there's so many different steps to it so you know i've gone back and forth with should we knock this one or this you know one or two of them off mm -hmm. um but since they're already in progress um i think we're gonna end up having 12 tracks on this Oh, cool. Next album. So. That's awesome. I was like, is there a limit? Because I got like 25 on my new one. <laughs> and I probably have enough for a double record. Wow. Yeah, I've been a writing yeah. fool lately, girl. I went. I only write when I go through like emotional heartbreak, pretty much. And I went through, I've gone through a lot of heartbreak in the past year and a half, two years. Girl, I feel you. Um, and so I've I literally. I've been over the last 10 years, so. 
<laughs> yeah, I hear you. Well, every time I get angry or sad, that's when I write. I can that's never write. That's when the write. best stuff comes out. Well, yeah, I can never write when I'm happy. I try my best, but it just, if I'm happy, it doesn't come out. So I was like, well, maybe that's why I'm cursed and I'm supposed to be like, you know, sad a lot or yeah. something like that just to get more material out. The first album was really about relationships. Like, yeah, it was so I focused was gonna... on that. And then the second one, of course, there's always going to be a relationship songs Mm -hmm. um well every song in the world is pretty much about a relationship you know there's a bigger range of subject matter Mm -hmm. on the second album so how do you write because everybody writes differently um you come up with like the melody line in your head and sing it and then write around that or do you write around beats or i kind of like this question because everybody's different for me personally every song tends to have a different start Mm mm-hmm I've written stuff from hearing Sean noodle around on his guitar, and I'll say, what is that? He's yeah. like, oh, I'm just goofing around. It's still let me record it on my phone. I'm writing a song to that. Yeah. There have been a few that have come about that way. Um, and So you write to the music first, or do you have lyrics it's that diff- pop in your it's head? Different it's different every time. Different every time. Okay, yeah, cool. so that might be for a couple songs, and then sometimes I'll just be singing in my kitchen, and I'll be like, ooh, that was kind of cool. Mm-hmm. And so I'll sing it into my phone and later expand on it. Yeah. Sometimes I just like open up a word document and type the first weird Mm -hmm. line that comes to my mind yeah so most recent story because i could not remember how i had started this song i was listening to a lot of beck and uh i love him uh what else was i listening to? peaches and cream baby peaches and cream i love that i just know that i was listening to a lot of beck and there were a couple other similar artists and i ended up writing a song called treading underwater and have you ever written a song and then when you're listening back to it you're like how did this even come about i don't even remember how i put this together yeah well i was working from home the other day and i looked up on my refrigerator and it said do not panic and it was a sticker that came Mm -hmm. like adhered to the refrigerator well do not panic is the first line of the song oh cool and And so i realized that that that's where the idea came from and then i wrote a whole song around it oh yeah well, you yeah. know, it's funny because I pull. I, I feel like as a true artist, you pull inspiration from your daily Every. activities. And I was laughing yesterday talking about the bougie video. I wear a wedding dress in that, which I never I go. Watch this. Yeah, and at the time, my heart had been broken by this girl who was telling me that she was not going to get engaged. And we were, like, having, you know, a great time. And then all of a sudden, she runs back, and evidently that was a lie. Then she's set to get married, like, next week or week weekend after that. But anyway, just ironically, you know, I, it broke my heart, and I was all sad. And I come in, and I tell my roomie, who just passed, I said, um, you know, I think I'm going to play my own bougie female in my video. And I said, I really wish I had a dress, because I don't own a dress. I haven't put on a, I put on a dress maybe twice, maybe three times in my life. You know, for my sister's wedding and a funeral and something else. I even wore a tux to prom once, you know what I mean? I did wear a couple dresses to prom. But anyway, long story short, I hadn't put on a dress in years, nor do I own any. And the roomie goes, hey, I have a, I have a wedding dress in my back room and she comes out with this huge wedding dress and I thought how ironic because the song that I had written was about another girl but I was currently at the time that I was doing the video going through a heartbreak of a second one Yeah. so who was dealing with a marriage issue evidently so I thought how ironic is this so she goes try it on and I was like you want me to try on your old wedding dress because she was since divorced but she was still hanging on this wedding dress for some reason Uh, and she was like yeah do it and I put it on and it fit perfect and it was weird now you know this how many times Times is a wedding dress fit perfect on the first try. I don't know if I do know that. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yeah. Have you ever been married? A couple times. Okay. A (laughs) couple times. Well, I've never been married. No kids. Uh, Yeah, yeah. By choice. No kids by choice. Yeah, same here. Do you get get flack for that? I would think we're around the same age. It's happened. Because I feel like I feel like people look at you if you're single and no kids and not married and like me. It feels different. I know that a lot of... um, how I live is unconventional and you know I've had to come to terms with certain things but it's choices you make for for what's best for your lifestyle and Mm -hmm. I you know yeah I I went through a time where a lot of people were asking about me starting a family Mm -hmm. having kids and yeah I had to really think deeply about like 
if I do this, is it because I really want to or because mm-hmm. everybody's giving me so much pressure about Correct. it? And if it's because everyone's giving me so much pressure about Society it, what kind of reason a is lot that of pressure to have a kid us. Right. that I have to take care of? Yeah. So, well, from my perspective, you know, I get a lot of flack because say, it, when you're single at my age, 40, and you don't have any kids and you've never been married, they look at you like something is wrong with you. And I'm like, no, there's nothing wrong with me. I chose that. Yeah, if I want to have a kid, I'll marry, gone, you know? I'll marry into a family with some with a woman who has a child or I'll adopt a child if I want for me personally looking at the world today and how it is I just don't think I could personally emotionally stomach having a child out there I would be in the floor crying non-stop yeah. worried to death about that. I'd probably end up in jail if I had a kid <laughs> why, why is that <laughs> oh I'm kidding I'm just I don't know if I have the patience yeah I just it was just one of those things um Growing up, I always thought, oh, yeah, that's what's supposed to happen. It'll happen at some yeah, point. But exactly. I was never one yeah. of those girls that was, oh, I can't wait to have a baby or yeah. whatever. Well, so. I was pretty much told that I couldn't have children for the most part, So, um, which was tormenting because I really did uh, early on want a, want a child. But then I, um, you know, as I got older, I started dating people who had children and whatnot. And I thought, you know, I could always marry into or you know, date someone who has a child who I could share that experience with or yeah. adopt a child or or take in an LGBT kid that parents have thrown them out on the street because I have been there as well. You know what I mean? So right. um, I really relate to kids and I love kids. I teach them all I the time. I do too. I love other people's yeah. kids. I honestly, um, when I was... <laughs> I love that. I well, love other I people's kids. Wait, I was married. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that Woo! needed that. Yeah. <laughs> then I hand it. them back. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then travel <laughs> and see the world. Yeah. And play rock and roll. Mm-hmm. Um, I was married um, to someone who had three children. We were together for ten years, and mm-hmm. those children taught me that you can love someone else's kids so much it, it doesn't require. Mm-hmm. That you have to have one that's that's yours, right? Um, just because that's what's expected. Yeah. Um, hey, I wanted to go back though, not to jump back, but back to the taking inspiration from your daily life yeah. and the bougie video. It just so worked out that I put on the wedding dress and it fit. So then I did the record as my own bougie chick in a wedding dress. Ironically, singing about the first girl who broke my heart, but the the uh, inspiration was taken from the second one about the marriage thing you know and so it's funny when you go back and you watch these things now and then since i've written probably 25 to like 30 songs already about that last relationship you know uh one time her kid left on my youtube video do you know who i am you know that's what she put and then i thought that'd be a great song so i wrote a do you know who i am my name is jen yates pronounced with an n yates do you know who i am you know and i switch it around like no do you know who i am and what i've done yeah you know so i feel like we we see things on a daily and we take uh that and we somehow channel it into art and the thing i love about art is you can say anything you want in art we can kill off earl right Mm -hmm. we can kill off earl in our song if we want to that's pretty funny that you say that because are um, you killing somebody off (laughs) and sweeter now yeah uh, i say when we do get a when we do get to play in a track yeah since we've talked about the knife and is yeah, it blood or yeah, yeah. cake Let's icing, talk about it. I, I, I kind of like your darkness since, you know, well, you're... Well, <laughs> this is like a rock and roll version of it. And I will, I, I do feel like I should say it is not mm-hmm. biographical. What happened is I wrote, um, have a binder that is uh, this thick. They can't see. Yeah. But it's a thick binder of uh, lyrics that I've written. And sometimes I'll read you know i'll read a page from it and i'll be like this really sucks Mm -hmm. i should throw this away but i'll find one line in it to keep you know what let me highlight that because i might come back and write a song around just that line and uh that's what happened with sweeter now i wrote this chorus that was um talking about icing from the cake and at least you're a little sweeter now is what it says but it's because she's she stabbed him with the cake knife i love it um, because he it, <laughs> Oops. Th- so when i went he back, ran was, into my knife 10 yeah. times <laughs> well when i was uh right. th- that was from chicago by the way from yeah. what chicago the oh, musical i saw it once yeah i don't I the don't opening know scene it well enough to the opening it, scene the girls are talking about they're all in jail for killing people and yeah. and the, there's a famous line where the girl said you know well he ran into my knife well he ran into my knife nine or ten times That's you know what i mean yeah anyway yeah. go ahead well it just so happened that i wrote 
the rest of the song around the idea of someone who was um, getting, you know, was in a, an abusive relationship mm-hmm. and she just kind of snapped yeah. at one point. And it all kind of centers around, it was his, the, the story in my head, it doesn't yeah. spell all this out in the song, but the story in my head was, it's his birthday, she made his favorite red velvet cake mm-hmm. for his birthday, but he comes home drunk and is like basically mm-hmm. demeaning and yeah. throws a plate at her, or whatever. Mm-hmm. The whole thing goes down and uh, yeah, it kind of ramps up. And, and then she stabs him. Yeah. Oh, right. Is yeah, that the one we're going to play? Is that the rum's going to burn or is that a different track? Uh, this one's sweeter now that All I'm right, talking sweeter about. sweeter now. That's it. We'll, we'll play that one. Let's do a the back to back one. Let's do a, uh, I want to spin the rum's going to burn and then we'll spin the one about the okay. chick killing the husband. Yeah, rum's going to burn is a were love Were they married song, so. in the song or they are just uh, partners? Eh, whichever. Eh, it doesn't state works. it. All right. Well, we're going to listen to a track off of uh, uh, Mad Lux Sweeter now. And I'm going to spin Rome's Gonna Burn, which I hear is awesome and catchy. Stay tuned. You're locked on to Generation Nation, LRS102.com, Mobile's Rock Stream.
That was sweeter now, right? Uh, all right, Fine. by Mad Luck. Uh, I love that. You said that was kind of like your goodbye Earl rock track, and rock version. and roll version. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. I'm a big fan of any song that kills somebody off. It you wasn't know? intentional. It just kind of rolled into that. Yeah. So. You know what's fascinating to me is I always say when you're writing songs, it's like you're birthing a child. You're, these are your babies. Oh my gosh, right? you not just say that because I have... Yeah. use that analogy yeah it, well it's a true <laughs> analogy that's probably why yeah but basically you're birthing these songs each song is different they're each a different baby you think they're going to come out one way and then usually by the time you go through the writing process the editing process the putting music to it or however you write whatever your writing process is by the time you get to the end of them when they're finished they sometimes are completely different than what you started with and yeah. sometimes the subject matter you know i'll start with a song that i want to write about say this specific person and then before I end up because of my life and what has gone on I end up kind of changing it to be about something else you know what I mean or sometimes I look back and it could be about both it just the writing process is so fascinating to me and that's why I love music and I love the artistic artists more than I love the cover band artist right because you can learn a lot from playing cover songs every song is going to teach you something you'll never know every song out there ever there's always a new song to learn but at the same time, it's a whole different type of music when you're writing your own. And from my experience of working with artists, you know, let's say I've worked with 100% of artists. From my experience, like 80% are more of the cover band stuff, where it, it may be even higher. But there's that 10% that are really good at writing their own stuff and getting their emotions out through song. And I feel like when we pass on and i've said this a lot it's so important for you to write and to get your music out there because when you leave this world that's what people are going to be listening to and those tracks will always be around we can always go back and listen to andy you know on her yeah. sweeter now record because it's on youtube or it's on itunes or wherever it is are you predicting my death right no no <laughs> no i do not want to predict I'm death <laughs> yeah i was like i've been doing enough but when death, i do girl. die you guys you got to go back and listen to my album of or course. you can listen to it now of of course, yeah, of course. <laughs> Listen to it now. I'm a big fan of go buy it. Go buy it. Spend money on it because uh, I'm a, you know, I'm lucky because I work at a radio station and people bring me in music all the time now. And I've got CDs out my yin yang, yeah. you know, and I can jam them out in my car and on air and stuff like that. But yeah, I'm a big fan because, you know, this is, it's a timestamp. Music is a timestamp for moments in our lives. Mm -hmm. And we can look back and be like, gosh, I was going through it. Oh, yeah. You know, um, I still look there. back at the bougie and just laugh, you know. I just put out that in September. So I go back now and I'll just laugh at it. It's just so funny to me, you know. It can be therapeutic. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's exactly why I write. I And um, I had um, somebody in yesterday. We were talking about this, too. Um, same idea. Um, but I write for my own therapy, for my own mental health, because... I feel like I write things, you know, sometimes in our daily lives, we don't get closure with certain things. And there are sometimes people live this world or whatever's going on where we will never get closure. And I've always been a person who needs closure with things. I need to have that set down talk with somebody and work it out. And I'm then it's the then it's washed clean, you know. But sometimes we don't get that in our daily lives. So for me, when I don't get that that's when I write. I write a lot to get my own closure with, with subject matters that are going on or heartbreaks or whatever is going on in your daily. Man, there are some tracks that like I still haven't released of Beverly McClellan's that, 
you know, there's one called the Mama's Mama, where she is thanking her grandmother because she was emancipated at 16 years old and ran away for her own rights and was never accepted by her own family. And it is heart wrenching, you know. And I've gone back and forth with, well, maybe I shouldn't put this out because I hate for her mama to hear it. But at the same time, I do want to put it out because one, I think Bev would always want to, if she wouldn't have written it, if she didn't want it out. But also, two, Look at all the LGBTQ youth out there that are going through the same thing that if they heard that, they might relate and it might help them. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I try not to, when I write, we were talking about this yesterday, or when other people write, I try not to think about how is this going to affect the person I wrote it about because I try to be so obscure. I try to drop hints. I'll drop hints about who I'm talking about, but I will not name drop. You know, like Eminem will name drop. They'll straight up call somebody out. Um, I call them out in more of a mysterious way, you know, but I'm going to put, I'm going to drop hints of, you're going to know who I'm talking about if you're in my daily life, you know, Mm -hmm. but if not, I try not to think about how is this going to affect them? Because if I, you know, if Bob Marley was worried about the sheriff here in the song where he kills off the sheriff, then he would have never put it out. Um, And I always use those same references. I need to get new ones, but you know, every song's written about somebody. Thunder Rolls, Garth Brooks. I mean, look at any of those, any of the rock and roll songs. A lot of them kill off people. Um, I love the Guns N' Roses track. I used to love her, but I had to kill her. Are they worried about the girl that they're killing off in the song, hearing it, and going crying? No, (laughs) they're not. It's art. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's an expression of emotions that we are trying to release from our body. That's how I look at it. Yeah, one of the tracks on um, on the album coming up, which you asked me about a release date earlier. I would love to say it's going to be out by the end of this year, but I think I said that in 2018 too. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping sometime early 2020. Mm-hmm. Um, but 2020 vision, girl. Yeah. 2020 vision. I feel like 2020 is a Grammy year for me. I don't know why. I just have this this gut instinct. I'm going for the Grammy. That's what I Do want. It. I want I'm a Grammy. I'm not quite there yet. <laughs> Well, you say that, but these tracks are amazing. These are awesome. Well, that came out almost five years ago. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, there were no Grammys awarded, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, uh, you never know, though, um, because, you know, say like uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers had like 13 records out before they ever got discovered. You know what I mean? And then if you ever do get discovered, people go back and buy this stuff. And then you might go, hey, wow, I, gotta, I wrote that 20 got years a ago. a whole bin full of them if that happens. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to pray that that happens for you. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 Well, one of the tracks on the upcoming album um, is called Carol Ann. And the thing about it... Is it like Poltergeist, yes. Carol Ann? Oh, it's come to it the light. Come is. to the light, Carol Ann. So it started <laughs> out with the idea of the verses before I even wrote the chorus. It started out about... When you would be performing out and look out to the crowd and so many people were on their phones that you would see this reflection. Which I'm on now. <laughs> She's sitting here staring at her phone. No, I'm just checking. Story. I'm just checking. Um, you know, some people uh, message me and they go, hey, your mic's too loud or we can't hear her or whatever. I'm always living to check in just to make sure everything's kosher. But I'm go ahead. Go ahead. Because I want to hear this story. I'm a big, po- you know, poltergeist scared the crap out of me when I was a kid. Do you know anything about the history of that? Oh, yes. Oh. How many people died on it? Yes. They had real about it. I saw bones and stuff. And oh, oh mm. there there yeah. was a curse going on there. Definitely. So I just, I started writing this song about how uh, it, it's not literal, but it's it's basically the concept of everyone that is staring at their phones instead of paying attention to what's going on in life and how we're constantly looking at our phones wanting more than what we have because of people only are posting about their, the whole phrase, my best life. And there you know you see all these celebrities on extravagant vacations and it just keeps Mm -hmm. especially our youth that are growing up with that um not to get all serious about this song but it's basically talking about how we're always wanting more and it's just going to get worse so it made me think about the reflection on our phones i would i would Mm -hmm. be at a gig and you know whether i was playing or someone else is playing you look around people are just like staring at their phones instead of Mm -hmm. like really paying paying attention attention to you right yeah so uh, have you ever seen the pretenders in concert no okay chrissy hine you know who she is yeah okay she's a phone nazi dude i went to see her at the palace this is reminding me of her No, it said there were signs posted, no phones even allowed in the venue. And if she, I would be sitting there, and of course I wanted to get a 
picture of her. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's my first time seeing the pretenders. Um, but I was terrified to touch my cell phone because while they were playing at the palace, she would see somebody on their phone and she goes, security, run here. And she would call them out and her lead guitarist would like flip them off in the middle of the songs. And all of a sudden you'd see security yeah, coming like that. drag somebody out. And I was like, dang, she ain't playing, man. That's not worth a picture. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it, it just reminded me of, you know, that blue light on everyone's face when mm-hmm. you're up there on stage looking out. And um, so that's how the, the whole concept of the chorus came together was don't don't go to the light, Carol Ann. Yeah. Like, oh, I stop love that. staring at your phones stop all the time. Stop staring at People. your phone. What a great concept. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> I think so, too. Ooh, I'm curious to hear that yeah. one. Yeah. Oh man, that's a uh, wow! That's cool. You must have been like watching Poltergeist or something like, or did it just pop up yeah, in your head? Come to in the my head. yeah, her putting her little hands on the TV of static. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's crazy. Uh, I used to watch scary movies all the time. I don't really watch TV I can't anymore. anymore. Yeah, same. I can't. And they've gotten way out of control. Like after the Saw videos came out I and the even Faces of mm-hmm. Death and all that, mm-hmm. I just was like, yeah, I really don't want to watch stuff like this. My whole thing was The Ring. The oh, ring The Ring. My life. The Ring is scary. I couldn't watch scary movies anymore after that. And yeah. The Grudge. The Ring and The Grudge. Well, I tell you what, I had a very terrifying moment the night that I went came home from the theaters um, watching The Blair Witch Project. I was literally living out in the middle of a cornfield in the middle of Why? nowhere, Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> um, because I had to, really, I had to, and I was in this back um, room, and there was no locks on the doors. I came home, of course, I was like shaken wow. from that movie, um, and I'm laying there with a friend, and we're sleeping, and we hear this knock on our window, and I was like terrified. I was like, "Did you hear that?" And they're like, "Yeah, I heard that." And I was like. Why would there be anybody knocking on my window at one o'clock in the morning in the middle of a cornfield in the country where there's hundreds of acres of nothing, you know? Um, and it happened again. I was terrified. And there's, again, no locks on the doors, no nothing. I didn't have any kind of weapon or tool or, you know, I might be picking up a shoe to hit somebody, you know, to protect myself. <laughs> but um, I don't know. There was just a couple of terrifying moments. And then after that, I just really did not watch any scary stuff anymore. I just couldn't do it. Yeah. Yeah. But I used to be a big fan when I was a kid. I sleep with a pair of scissors under my pillow. Do you really? So you guys better you got watch. A, I was gonna out. say you got a knife on your you album cover. You sleep with, with scissors. scissors. I would not sleep with you. <laughs> you might scare the crap out of me. Yeah, no, I don't sleep with anything. I don't even own a gun. Nothing, you know. I no, just I don't own a gun. Yeah. just a few pairs of scissors. A few pairs of scissors. Well, I do have a um, a bow and arrow because my theory is that's probably not going to kill you, but it's definitely going to hurt. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So if you see me coming out like Link or... Uh, Hunger Games. <laughs> Hunger Games or... Yeah, I was trying to think. Who's the... Uh, oh, oh, I can't think of his name right now. But anyway, you know, the famous uh, the famous bow and arrow dude and all the... Uh, Robin Hood. Yeah, I would be Robin Hood. And, you know, get away from me. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about... Do you have any gigs coming up that people can attend? So, I can uh, talk about our gig this Saturday night All right. with Julius and Banshee Child and Mad Luck. Mm-hmm. It's at 10 o'clock at 3rd Street Dive. It is going to be one hell of a party, I think. So Cool. 3rd Street Dive, I love that place. Yeah. It's like a little hole in the wall that's just groovy. I used to play it's the old one. It's such a cool hangout. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I used to play the old one, and then they moved next door. Um, and I've played there a couple times over the years. Just, in fact, when my Nashville friends come in and they play there, I go set in sometimes, you know. Yeah. And Julius, by the way, kudos to them. They're on our LRS Fest this year. Woo-hoo. I know. But I'm what? excited. For yeah. Well deserved. Yeah. And by the way, I do want to remind everybody, since I've got this here in front of me, um, that on August 31st, um, via, there's going to be a VIP Bourbon and Beyond drawing. We've been giving away tickets to Bourbon Beyond. I don't know. Have Sweet. you seen that lineup? Uh, yeah. Hall and oh. Oats is all I had to see. Let me see. Food oh, Fighters. John Fogarty, The Flaming Lips. I love Joan Jett, Blackberry Smoke, Foo Fighters, Robert Plant, Daryl Hall, and John Oates. By the uh-huh. way, I just taught a kid the other day, and uh, I teach kids for a living, you know, uh, drum set. 
Awesome. And I always ask the kids what kind of music they like because they always like different styles of music. And this kid said Led Zeppelin and Hall and Oates. That's what he said. That's that was a cool his kid right that there. was his two favorite Hall and bands. Oates and I was like, wow, your parents have done well with you, kid. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, yeah. But Tri Anastasia is going to be there. I actually played. Um, I toured with uh, members of Fish's horn section for a while. Um, as well as Parliament Funkadelic. So that's Ooh. cool. Go check out Trey Anastasio. They were all best friends. Allison Krause, Squeeze is going to be there. Do you remember mm-hmm. Squeeze? Mm-hmm. Uh, Tempted by the Fruit of Another. Yes. Yeah, you got to love that. Grace Potter, who's hot as hell. ZZ Top, <laughs> Zach Brown Band, uh, Leon Bridges. I mean, the list is ridiculous. And White Reaper. I want to give them a shout out because I used to teach the drummer uh, when he was a little kid. So, wow. And Eddie Brickell, I love her. She's married to Paul Simon. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we're going to be doing that free uh, VIP bourbon and beyond drawing at the Floyd County Brewing Company. And that's going to feature Golden Ticket and Chris Robino and the Newberg Soul. That's 8 to 11 on August 31st. So, And then, of course, we've also, in October, got LRS Fest coming up. So stay tuned to LRS. You can win tickets. We're going to be all over the place throughout the month, you know, giving away tickets and doing drawings and all kinds of cool stuff. Yeah, so congrats on that gig. Saturday night, what time do you go on? Um, the show starts at 10. 10 p.m. Is there a cover? Uh, you put me on the spot. I bet there is. If there at, is, it's only five bucks. Okay, for yeah, three I was going to say, Third Street Dive is usually about remember. five bucks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I've hung out there many times. And uh, yeah, it's a groovy space for. You, you know, I talk a lot about this. A lot of the venues around town, they. Louisville is always a, a, an interesting place, and we were just talking about the difference between w- our love for Nashville and our love for Louisville because I love both. I really do. Um, there was a time period last month where I or last year that I thought I was probably going to move there, um, and then some things ended up uh, bringing me back here. Louisville always sucks me back in. Louisville is a great city. It is for me though. It is tough. I'm not going to lie because one, I don't have any family here. You know, zero family. Everybody I have is closer to Nashville, Bowling Green, Adair County, right. Lake Cumberland. In fact, I told you I grew up in in Lake Cumberland, and Lake Cumberland is the river that literally flows into Nashville. So I was on the Kentucky side of it, basically. Yeah. Um, you know, but for some reason, you know, I had been going through a lot of tough times here, and I feel like I get a lot of flack sometimes. Um, you know, everybody thinks you're a local drummer, and I'm like, no, I've toured the world and been to L.A. and played New York City and, you know, and toured Canada and did all these really cool things and been on book covers and, uh, you know, been recognized as one of the top females in, female drummers in the country. I'm not just local, and nor am I even from here, which is kind of interesting, you know. And then to do all that and to come back here and like a, a cover band go, yeah, we're, we just don't think you're that good, you know. It's pretty heartbreaking sometimes. So yeah. Louisville, I always feel like beats me up a little bit. I write about that a lot in my songs. I keep rolling with the punches in the 502 because that's what I do, you know. It's that's just rolling funny. with the punches in the 502, man. I feel like Nashville beats me up a little bit. Nashville can be the same way, and it's so That's weird. That's a tough town, unless you it have is. the time and um, it, and the, the way connections. that I see it is, if if you're going to put all your heart and soul into music and can afford to um, put all your efforts there yeah. to really try to make it, but I'm kind of. In a, I'm in a situation where that's not the case. Right. So I wanted to experiment. We played there for a year with a couple guys that were local to mm-hmm. Nashville. Yeah. We had a blast. We got to play um, a handful of places. But unless, unless number one, like I said, that you do have the time to really put into pushing your yeah. band and, yeah. and getting solid and, and trying for something bigger. Mm-hmm. Um and then you know actually knowing people and having a network down there yeah it takes a lot of time and effort to do yes um, what's weird for me is um when i was you know in my my look i'm gonna guess about 18 to 21 because i moved to louisville at 21 it was 1999 for those of you who can do math 
Um, and my whole life growing up playing music, I've been playing music since a child, and they all were like, you should go to Nashville and pursue music. And I ran from Nashville the whole time, you know. I was like, I don't want to play country. I want to play rock and roll. I don't exactly. want to. So I ran off to Louisville via a job. But Nashville always sucked me back in. I got to play with the uh, Bobby Keys, the saxophonist of the Rolling Stones, Rest in Heaven, who is now, you know, passed um, down in Nashville at the Mercy Lounge. Um, Beverly McClellan and I did City Winery several times for some major record labels down there. Um, and we actually played more than one gig. We did the Lipstick Lounge a lot. Uh, those are That's owned by friends of mine. Um, you know, and then, you know, uh, I just did the five spot with this Americana artist named Lori Joe Bridges. Nashville always sucks me back in. And then, of course, the documentary coming out on the film um, in September. It's like I, as much as I try to get away from Nashville, too, it sucks me back in. But Louisville can be a very mean city sometimes. But I'm going to try to look at the positive of it and try. And there's a lot of amazing people here um, that I love. And it's the community of those people, the LGBT community, the true musician community you know not the fakes but there there are some you know there are some fakes always anywhere um and then i just try to stay away from dixie highway <laughs> and usually i'm good <laughs> if i stay in the highlands <laughs> oh, that's no offense crazy. to dixie highway people i do love you but it's a little it's a little beyond my i mean i come from a very redneck town um and i was running from that so i don't want to go back to that if you know right. what i'm saying yeah I told you, I grew up in Georgetown, so I yeah. was running barefoot in the creeks. Exactly, same back here. Back in the day. I'm a country girl at heart. I really am. I'm a, uh, I call it Kentucky Simple. I'm, that's anti-bougie. It's, <laughs> you're, you're not, I'm not high maintenance at all. I, a high key, nails, low right? class. Yeah, 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 exactly. So I like to keep it Kentucky Simple. You know, just groovy and cool and uh, don't need a lot of, uh, I'm not high maintenance at all. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. I do love Louisville, though. Man, once I found the Highlands, I was like, yeah, this is my love. And, it, and as much as I've tried to move away and get out of the city and forget everybody here, it just, it always brings me back. You yeah, know. It, it's, it's a great community. And I think, you know, not everyone goes through the learning curve. I went through, um, when I first started in music it was unexpected I hadn't really planned to do it but um, like I said things kind of led me there it it was a little competitive yeah um, you talking in about my Louisville? mind well in my in my mind really like feeling like um, oh they got this gig why'd they get this gig and I was just having that mindset instead of just being supportive yeah of other people mm -hmm. and their successes and what I have found in um, again sh changing my mindset about yeah. how I look at it mm -hmm. is when you're supportive of other people mm -hmm. sometimes it comes back around uh, absolutely um, absolutely you know, and by the way the opposite works too when you're not supportive of people karma comes back bite around too it yes. will bite you in the ass and I always try to be supportive you know I've had people again not hire me and then i'll go sit front row and watch their band mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying yeah. but i've never seen them do that to mine so i try to be supportive of my musician family out there as much as possible um it is a very competitive city but it took me getting outside of here and then finally going you know what none of them are on a on a book you know no you know i've done i finally was like i don't gotta prove myself to nobody finally i had to find that That's confidence a big thing too is when you feel like you have to prove yourself who are you proving yourself to? Yourself. Exactly. Mm -hmm. so. Because if other people don't want to see your successes, then that's their problem. You know, it has not, it, what other people think of it is none of your business, yeah. right? I've and had, it's true. I've had some, uh, well, I've had a couple experiences where people have been not so nice about what they've said about my voice. Right. And it it's funny how you can hear a hundred great things but hear two really negative yeah and uh, take it to heart yeah, yeah. And, and it we it tend can to take to heart things the, and I'm, i think i've finally kind of gotten past that yeah well i'm gonna tell you i've worked with a lot of very famous vocalists in my day and some fantastic ones and i love your voice so don't you. listen to them thank you they're a pos uh -huh, uh -huh. If they say that about your voice, <laughs> <laughs> coming from someone who's done music their whole life yeah, and been a I professional musician that. for the past 12 years, you know, um, I, and I would tell you, cause I'm straight up, I'm like a Simon Cow. I'm like, yeah, no, 
<laughs> you know, I, I straight up will tell people Except what I think. you got to do an accent. <laughs> I cannot do an accent. I can't do it. Although it's funny, when I went to Canada, they would be like, where are you from, Texas? You know, they always thought that I had a southern accent, which I do. I have a little bit of a country accent because I am from the country. Yeah. Um, but I'd be like, yeah, nowhere near Texas. And then I'd say Kentucky, and they'd be like, is that near Texas? I'm like, no, nowhere near Texas. Because just like we don't know their providences, they have no idea, uh, like, what states are near yeah. what. They're just like, oh, that's the United States. You know, they yeah. don't know. But I always thought it was funny. They always tell me I have the cutest little accent, you know. And it comes out when I'm back home with the family. It comes out a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't think I had one. And then we would go in to record some of these songs. And I was, and it's on there. You can hear it if you listen for it now. Where I'll say, right. Yeah, lie, right. And I'm like, dang yeah. it. It's not what I want. I always like to say, get tar. And they're like, what are you going to go get tar off your roof? And I'm like, <laughs> okay. Or I say, whoa, man. Whoa, man. Woman, I never I could say woman, that. woman, women. I don't know, whatever it is. And they're like, "Whoa, man!" And my favorite one ever, my favorite story was I was working with Sarah Lee, who is the bass player of the B fifty twos. She toured with Joan Osborne, Natalie Merchant, Gang of Four, Thompson Twins, everybody. She, oh man, she had some great story about the Thompson Twins. She was on tour with them in the eighties, and she said this was back before like computers were really used in the music, and they had tape cassette machines underneath the stage that would have their backing vocals on it so if they were even one second or one beat per minute off of their timing thing those vocals would come in in the wrong spots so they i was like that would be terrifying but anyway sarah lee i don't like using tracks for anything yeah 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 oh well i actually use a lot of tracks i uh i track everything i've got a loop machine i've got a sampler i do hip-hop i play over top of it rap you know i do all this stuff like with cover when people do cover songs oh yeah you mean just just, straight up tracks yeah yeah. no that's karaoke yeah Mm -hmm. in my opinion yeah um i don't fault people for using tracks but um you know in a live setting if you don't use them and blend stuff over top and play instruments over top then it is karaoke in my opinion because anybody can pull up a karaoke track and sing to it i mean i can do that all day but i ain't gonna i am not gonna try to sell myself as a musician doing that no i will use samples and loops and then trigger those and play over top and then rap over top and stuff like that and layer in actual music uh that i feel like you have to do if you're if you're even going to get to any kind of pro level if you look at any drummer playing with anybody they're going to have a machine and they're going to be doing that because if you don't I, when i went to la i mean they, they're like light years ahead of us in kentucky with stuff like that you know what i mean but yeah. You're not going to go see any major artist like a Gaga that doesn't have a drummer that does that. Or like a Madonna. Her drummer does that. You know, you'd, it's almost like the drummer is now the DJ too. Because you got the drum set, you got the electronics, you got the computers, the, uh, you know, everything. Yeah. The drummer is like the brain of the whole operation, the foundation. So anyway, but yeah, I agree with you on the track thing. Totally. But again, I, I do feel like it's hard to do that live with a live band doing tracks in between and when i say tracks i'm not meaning the entire song i'm talking about like portions of the song that are like looped that you're playing over top of that just add like effect in the background stuff like that sound effects i love all that stuff i say we bring the tapes back though a cassette tape yeah yeah cassette tape so back i wanted to tell you sarah lee (laughs) she had this crazy british accent and I had this deep southern gravelly country accent, and we had a language barrier slightly, and she was my bass player for a show called Girlfriend at Actors Theater, and she would, she would look at me and she goes, I did not know that the word dead, dead, D-E-A-D, was three syllables. And I was like, did I say it like that? And she said, yes, you say it like dead. And I was like, oh, I didn't notice. But I guess, you know, country people, we just like to draw out things Mm -hmm. a little bit longer. Yeah. So she was funny to work with, though. Yeah, that's cute. Yeah, very cute. Yeah. She's a badass, by the way. She is the bass player on uh, Love Shack. If you watch that video, she's in there with RuPaul. Yeah. She had some amazing stories. I just loved her. Anyway, and she used to, the best thing about her, she used to date the lead female bass player for David Bowie his whole career Ma- Gail Ann Dorsey Bowie. well did you know he had a very famous female bass player named Gail Ann Dorsey bald head chick 
and she's right beside him in almost every video you watch and she was his main bass player for years because he's smart once you find that spark you don't you don't deviate right. you stay right there with it That's because yeah exactly you got to know what works when it works yeah so we're gonna spin some tracks i'll let you pick out some rock and roll stuff today and uh you said you loved aerosmith so i wanted to spin this track because it's one of my favorites it's called pink it's off their nine lives record me and my sis used to sing it at the top of our lungs when it came out. So here's Samara Smith. You're locked on to LRS102.com, the Walrus Louisville's Rock Stream. All right, that's Marcy's Playground with Sex and Candy. I am the Generator. You're locked on to Generation Nation, LRS102.com, the Walrus. Andy, how are you doing? I've got Miss Andy Ramser up in my studio today. Got a nice fan blowing my hair. Yes, you do. I'm feeling good. Yeah, you're looking nice and, and, and uh, not so, like, sweaty like some of our people. <laughs> in. I had poor Marvin Maxwell up in here for an interview who owns Mom's Music, who I worked with for years, and poor man, he was just, he was constantly sweating, you know? It gets a little hot in here during the day it's a little warm yeah it's a little toasty we like this to keep is it a like a toasty. comfortable temperature for me yeah and we were just talking about off record or off air about uh how it's always interesting here because i was telling you when i was putting together she castle which was a a, a benefit for my beverly mcclellan who passed away you know who mm-hmm. by the way she had toured with bb king steve vi bought her guitar she was nominated for grammys with him won glad awards we toured all over the place doing all these pride festivals and women's music festivals we were talking about you know a put that together and I started to pick band members and singers and stuff like that which I would love to have you on next year because it's going to be an annual fundraiser by the way it was also the first first time ever that um, there was a women's music festival in Kentucky and in Louisville that featured nothing but women on stage we had never had that before now there's that applause button I know oh I've got laughter I think it's laughter but I, I definitely need like my rim shot yeah listen to this one I love this one that's the sad one <laughs> I love my sound effects. No, but you know, That's great, um, yeah. When I met Bev, I was the house drummer of Michigan Women's Music Festival, as well as Ohio Women's Music Festival, and there's a National Women's Music Festival, and those festivals are put on by women, only for women. There are no men on stage. Women are running the sound, the lights, Damn, everything. Man. Yeah, and not, nothing toward our dudes, but, you know, I'm y'all, just, they'll have all these women benefits, but they'll have all these dudes backing them. And I'm like, we've got these awesome musicians in this city. Yeah. Why can't you pick some chicks to do it, you know? So I wanted to do it, and turns out it was the first time it was ever done. So it's going to be an annual thing next year, bigger stage. i got a whole horn section when it come in, a string section, you know, because I've played in orchestras and theaters and, you know, done some really cool things. Um, and I know all kinds of female musicians uh, all over the world. I'm like, and, you know, and we just started here local and... And thought it'd be cool to do so we're gonna be gonna doing grow. that annually i see it now it's absolutely bigger and bigger. yeah but we were talking about how it's funny because the original band scene which i've done for years uh, as well as the cover band scene which i've done for years a lot of those scenes don't know each other player wise and that was really cool to bring all these chicks together to go hey yeah. i didn't know them i'd heard of them but i never met them or vice versa see, because I dip, my, I dip a foot in each side yeah, and that's good, and and you kind of have to because I mean covers will pay the bills with the right covers, right? Um, you know, not really pay the bills, but it'll ex- you know you'll make more money. You Our know? Um, acoustic duo, Strung Out Loud, woo woo, yeah, um, that helps us fund the Mad Luck original yeah. project. So. Yeah, that's what I feel like you have to do. You play the covers fun. for money. Sometimes I'm sitting there and I'm thinking I'm getting paid to sing mm-hmm. and drink. Mm -hmm. this is great yeah yeah no kidding when i've (laughs) always done the same thing you fund your original works via everything else but for me uh in my 40s looking back now i feel like i don't have to explain myself to anybody they can criticize all they want Mm -hmm. you can tell me i'm a crappy drummer i really don't care uh you know i feel like i've done some really amazing things uh like i said even even the film coming out is going to have todd chuckerman of sticks and all these amazing female drummers and guy drummers from all over the world i've got a big feature film part in it um and for me i feel like i am always graduating from the bar scene because I've played every bar here multiple times for many years, you know, 21 years I've been playing music here in Louisville, and I was playing music before that, before I even got here. And I feel like, well, I can make $100 an hour going and teaching a kid how to play something versus a hundred to two hundred dollars a night going out here and spending five hours and setting up a drum set and playing for three four hours and you know it's just not fun to me that's not fun to me sitting in a room and writing original songs 
recording, production, all that, that is more fun to me. Finding creative artists to, to play with and to collaborate with and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, by now we're like, I'm like 20, 25 album, albums deep. Um, with production from all different styles. I'm Got about 20 away from you. Yeah. So. Nice. And I'm about 102, I might be. <laughs> You're funny. Uh, yeah, but you know, and I've done every style. So, and, and then I've got the own, the solo record where it's just, I literally play every instrument. I produced it. I wrote it. I'm doing all the videos. I directed everything, you know, and, uh, and I'm doing my own vocals. So, it is what it is. You know, I'm just going to keep doing that route because I feel like the bar scene to me is not really, I want to graduate from it. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like I, I've done it enough. We had we had a goal in mind when we first started Mad Luck, which, you know, we put that album out five years ago and mm-hmm. Sean has moved around to, to Florida and then to Nashville and we've both continued to work together. I've never stopped writing, but... Um, you know, just some family circumstances mm-hmm. caused the distance. And, um, you know, we had some bigger plans. I, I would love to open up for regional or national bands. Sure. But we've just, it's been a little bit of a roller coaster ride. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to say this publicly because I'm really hoping that uh, this comes to fruition. But sure. we've been playing as a three piece with um, me, Sean Ewing. And Chip Adams on bass. Chip's been with oh, us. We love since. Chip. I love oh, Chip. God, Tell him I said hello. Yeah, he? he's great. Um, he's been with us since we tried to put a band together back mm-hmm. in 2014. Um, but I don't know if, if you're familiar with Nick. I had to write how he's going to crack up if he hears this. <laughs> McElwain. Nick McElwain. Nick he, McElwain. I've heard of him, yes. He's the drummer with Kirby. Yeah. Kirby, and yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he wants to he's do got that, some original he's got that stuff. Origi- he's got that green drum set, that neon green Man, one. Man, he's yeah. got some energy that, that we're excited to bring Good. to Mad Luck. But Drummers always bring that energy, girl. Yeah. We, we are the most energetic of the yes. whole group, and we have to it be. It holds it. It's the backbone. It literally is the yeah. backbone. I always say that... Um, Drums are the foundation. So if you have a cracked foundation, it doesn't matter what you build on top of it. It's never going to work. And you cannot take a band that's got three front singers and then try to put a foundation under it. You have to start with the foundation. Uh, And it's just like when you go into a recording studio. I was telling you, I just came from Dark Horse Recording Studio in Franklin where Paramore recorded and Hailstorm and uh, Dolly Parton's personal recording studio, Faith Hill, Martin McBride, Allison Cross. I mean, it was, they had sold over a hundred million number one hit records out of that studio and we were talking about this down there um you know when you go in to record tracks with a full band guess who's going to go first i mean usually sometimes they do it different where everybody's at once but if the drums and the bass aren't solid it doesn't matter what you put on top you know what i'm saying so you have to have that foundation and buddy rich always says this you can take an average drummer with a great band and the band will be average. But you can take a great drummer with an average band, and the band will be great. And it's a true story. Yeah. It's all about the drummer when you're in a band, because you can't have a band without a drummer. I mean, you can, but it's not technically a band. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. Well, it's funny you say that, because we have been playing as a three-piece until we found the right guy. Yeah, that's and, good. Uh, well, you found I a good one. I feel pretty confident that Nick's the right guy. We... Um, we haven't even had a practice with him yet, and I'm making this announcement, so now he has to stay with us. But, <laughs> um, we're going to roll out uh, our debut show with him this fall. Um, we're shooting for October, so cool. stay tuned on that. Well, congratulations on that. There's nothing yeah. like um, playing with a live drummer who's really great. Right. You know. And we did have that luxury for a while with uh, Donnie Highland. Oh, I love Donnie. Was our drummer for the first few years. Yeah. But again, we were dealing with the challenge of Sean um, moving to Florida and just trying to put on shows was mm-hmm. so what complicated. What part of Florida did he move to? Fort Myers. Okay, right on. Yeah. Yeah, I was down there in Naples playing a show for a while. And then, of course, Beverly McClellan, my girl, was down there in Fort Lauderdale. So I traveled a lot back and forth last year in the past six years, back and forth. The, what I call the House of Hope, where the dreams don't fade. We uh, That's a reoccurring theme through the Hillbilly Swagger record. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I was down there a lot doing I've toured all through Florida with Kelly Ritchie and all kinds of people, you know, over the years. Freak Bass and I did a lot of cool things down there. And me I tried and to play down there uh, with the duo. It just was not my favorite 
place. Yeah. It's I tell you what. Kind of rough for Key Largo music. was by far my favorite place to tour down through there. And Naples. I was in Naples in uh on the beach with in a multi million dollar condo with a brand new car, you know. Nice. Doing some theater shows. Yeah, and they had me acting next to people that were on General Hospital and uh, Wings and Cagney and Lacey and all these shows. It was very, it was an interesting thing. It was a show that was here at Actors Theater. They got picked up for national tour. It was called The Christians. Um, and we did, I was like in the Christian rock band on stage, which was a really fascinating piece of theater. Yeah. Um, one of the coolest things Sounds I've gotten cool. to do, yeah. Basically, the audience turns into your congregation and it questions your it questions Christianity and your faith and what you really believe. Do you believe that everybody goes to hell when they die? You know, if you're a Christian, or do you believe if they don't believe? I mean, or if they if they've never heard of Jesus? The whole thing was all about if uh, you know this kid overseas who's never heard of Jesus before goes in and saves his sister from uh, a car bombing. Um, and comes out and he dies. Do you, as a Christian, believe that he is going to hell because he had never heard of Jesus? Or do you believe that he is going to heaven because he saved his sister and did a good deed? That's some deep shit. It was deep. It oh, was some deep. Sorry. Yay. We love cuss words. Where's, Where's my life? <laughs> I got a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> I, love, I love a cuss word. I love a bomb drop, you know. Um, but yeah, so it was a fascinating piece. And at the end of the... Uh, the Ooh, Fancy yeah. dollar right She's here. got like a dollar that's literally like, it's been ironed or something. I'll put that in the swear jar here in just a second. Yeah, we'll donate that off to charity. I love to drop <laughs> the ironed. drop the bomb or say fuck. <laughs> Ow! I love it. I love a dirty word. I don't know why I always have. Um, but yeah, so anyway, it was a great, it was a cool thing to get to do. Yeah. yeah. Have you ever done any theater or anything like that? So, strangely enough, no, but yes. No, uh, no and yes <laughs> not theater but through doing music i did get approached by um this fella named josh who had taken over alix adams uh -huh. at the time and this is when i kind of quit my career for a few years to pursue music only and i was looking yeah. for a little something else to make me some money yeah and so i ended up um signing on with alix adams to do talent work and i had never done that before yeah but it was a complete blast so i've, I've done commercial work and i did do a um a pilot for a show called seasons of disorder That's that cool. my buddy dave was putting together david brewer he's uh fantastic but um yeah so yeah, that's super cool. I miss it. It's always I mean, fun to branch out and do something. Because, I mean, in music, there's so many facets. You know, you can do yeah. the cover band. You can write originals. You can do theater. You can travel the world doing all kinds of really cool stuff. Like, I had a friend that was on cruise ships, like musical directing. You know, yeah. uh, there's just so many cool things that you can do. You I wasn't know? singing in any of these, but it was fun just having a little bit of a different type of creative outlet. Most recently, it was Lazy Boy Furniture Modeling. That was... That was really exciting. What did you like lay around in Lazy Boys <laughs> I, all sexy? I seriously and got paid to um, to run my hands across the back of a nice Lazy Boy outdoor furniture set, and I then love this. Sit sit down and lounge, show how comfortable it was. Uh -huh. That's fluff, interesting. Fluff some pillows, and then they put you on TV doing that, or what? It's, I believe it's on their website. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. You know, uh, getting and I in, have clothes on, so oh, get your I, mind out of the gutter, well, people. I see. I almost asked that, but then I was like, <laughs> "No, I'll be." That's like I'm flirting or something. I should not do that. Um, no, but yeah, that's interesting. I was gonna say uh, if you also get into like the jingle, you know, their their voiceover work. Yeah, when I was out in L.A., they came and found me and made me do voiceovers for Funny Guy. Isn't that wild? Yeah, that's yeah. cool. Yeah, I got though. to go to Fox Animation Studios and like hang out with the whole crew that, ha and the lady who had found me had hired like Seth Green and the whole cast. Man. You know that vo does the voiceovers. See, my only voiceover work was the uh, phone when you when you called Midway University. Yeah, I was the the voice that told you what number to push <laughs> somebody told Isn't me that once exciting that, yeah you know what's even more <laughs> exciting somebody once asked me if i'd ever done those like uh the sexy phone lines you oh, know like yeah. the ooh yeah 
you know, all those dirty talking things. So did you? No, I have <laughs> never. I mean, I've talked totally dirty to girlfriends on the phone and stuff like that, but I've never done anything quite like that. Yeah. Um, I think it'd be hilarious, though. If they paid me enough, heck yeah, why not? You reminded me, <laughs> since we were talking about Aerosmith earlier, yeah. of the, um, oh, the, shoot, what's the name of the song where the video... At the beginning, it shows the hot, sexy girl on the phone, but oh. at the end, it shows the lady, the oh. old lady ironing in her nightgown. Oh, what's the name of that one? It's on big ones, isn't it? It's one of the big hits, isn't it? Uh, I don't know. Somebody call in to tell us or Google yeah. us or send us a Facebook message yeah. or a text and tell us what the heck that... It's a sweet emotion. Oh, I think it is. Sweet emotion. Just yeah. Took me a second. Yeah. yeah. Man, they had some great, they had some great videos. I and was obsessed. I've, I got to meet the band and hang out with you them. You did? Aerosmith? Uh, yeah. Oh, tell me about that. We got time to talk about Aerosmith. All right, then. I got yelled at by their <laughs> bodyguard, Big Mike. Okay. So, it um, it was through uh, what was Clear Channel at the time. Yeah. The promotions director, I, I got a chance to get backstage with um, some of the other people that had access and so we were doing a little meet and greet and after they did their sound check we got to hang out in this room and each they they put these groups of like five people together said okay we're gonna put you in a line and when you're next we'll motion you over and you get to take your picture with the band and then immediately get the hell out Mm -hmm. um not out of the room but just like out of line so the next group can go so I'm standing there waiting for our turn and I'm looking and I'm like, okay, like trying to figure out, I got to get right next to Steven, like mm-hmm. before anybody else gets there yeah. out of our group of people, I got to be next to Steven Tyler. So I ran up and I'm right next to him and my smile is like from ear to mm-hmm. ear and they take the picture and they said, um, uh, we're going to have to retake this, ma'am, we need you to, uh, kind of duck down a little bit you were right in front of joe perry (laughs) and i turned around and joe perry was just like "Mm," you know irritated and i felt like such an ass and so our turn is up and big mike their bodyguard big old dude comes Mm -hmm. up to me he goes that was really rude what you did to joe perry (laughs) and he's all in my face and he said that was disrespectful and i was almost in tears yeah i was so embarrassed you know well, you didn't mean to do it didn't you explain hey i'm no. sorry i i mean oh i told oh, no I offense explained. but you're not really that tall i mean joe no, perry must joe be Perry a, short yeah i was gonna say he must so be if you can stand in front of him and hide him i explained and i said i'm so sorry i was just so excited mm-hmm. whatever and he could tell i was kind of sh- you know mm-hmm. i was shaken i i didn't like being called out um yeah so fast forward I'm trying to get in the front row. Uh, when the lights go down, the curtains open up. I like ran up to the front row, and this guy goes around and starts checking tickets. Mm-hmm. And I'm up against the uh, as close as you can get. Yeah, you're and, like drooling over. But the I had line. like tenth row tickets. Yeah. So I wasn't supposed to be up there. Right. And the guys checking tickets, and Big Mike comes up. And he smiles at me. He said, that girl's with me. She can stay up here. Oh, how cool totally is that? Wow, chicka, wow, wow. Yeah, yeah that I was love my that. Story. That's amazing. I've met a lot of pretty famous people in my day. I, you know, I've never really quite been starstruck that much. I mean, I got to play with Chris Robinson of the Black Crows, the, some of the Rolling Stones members, you know. Um, Man, Tim McGraw opened for early on, of course, yeah. you know. And I've opened for a lot of country stars. I don't know why it's always been country. But also, uh, Taylor Dane, Tiffany. Tiffany tried to make out with me one night. <laughs> yeah, Which was funny because I had her you. cassette tape. Well, she had the tatas way out. Now. And she, yeah. At one point, my lead singer looks at me and she goes, do y'all know each other? Because she's singing and she's singing right to me. And I was like, this is very strange. It's like some kind of weird, you know, pool that we had. But she tried to get me backstage to do bourbon shots with her and it was all up on and all kinds of, I was just like, awkward. <laughs> so I've got some pretty hilarious stories too. Yeah. 
Uh, and when I was out in L.A., Courtney Love was at my show, uh, The Bangles, uh, you know, and my band had all toured with some cool, cool people. Anyway, and they've all called in, by the way. They've all called in on the show. I've had call-ins from uh, my bass player was is on tour with Kesha right now, and she toured with Tegan and Sarah and Kate Bush and uh, uh, the Pussycat Dolls, yeah. Will I Am. She's done some cool things. And then the lead guitarist called in. Was on tour with uh, Lindsey Buckingham. She also toured in Meredith oh, Be- who's that? Meredith Brooks. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I know. She literally, they, they all know everybody. It was crazy. And of course, Julie Wolf, the famed Julie Wolf, who had toured with the Indigo Girls and Honey DeFranco and produced Carly Simon. And you know, we're still really close friends. You know, I've just got some really cool, interesting people. You would have loved this. The other day, we had uh, Shannon Conley on who is now on a, she's the vocalist on the national tour with Hedwig and the Angry Inch, which is a very famous Broadway musical. Uh, Neil Patrick Harris kind of brought it back several years ago. But she's also the female lead singer of Les Zeppelin, the all-female cover band of Led Zeppelin, which I thought was really awesome. She also did, like, voiceover work for Nickelodeon and X-Men and just really cool thing. You know, I have people call in from all over the world that I've worked with over the years just to kind of give their stories just like you are, you know, which is awesome. Yeah. Today it's all about you, though. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. What girl doesn't want it all about them? You know what I'm saying? (laughs) (laughs) So we've got the gig coming up Saturday night. Uh, Anything else you want to tell our listeners about? We've talked a lot about the cover band stuff versus the original artist stuff. And we were just talking about how literally you have to start somewhere. And covers pay a lot more money, uh, obviously. Uh, Originals give you more therapy i feel like and more um what's the originals word? are where my my passion is but yeah. i do have fun playing covers we we pick a lot of songs that that we like i mean we do some of the crowd pleaser yeah. type songs but yeah the standards i call them yes yeah. and it, but we love the 80s we love the 90s and so many of the songs that we do like are by male artists it's yeah. kind of fun to turn them around and put our own oh, twist yeah. on them so, put a gender flare on them yeah, yeah so a lot of the stuff you hear we, we do some hall and oats and cool which hall and oats do fighters we do uh, you know hall and oats had the first song with a drum uh with a drum machine in it in the 80s what well, hall what hall and oats songs do you do we do man eater oh yeah and we do uh i just taught I man don't go eater for that Oh, I love that, that one too. Yeah. I just taught a kid man eater last week, so I, I was like, the kid wanted to learn man eater. I was like, sure, kid. Sweet. All right, quarter note, quarter note, drum beat with some eighth note, uh, linear kicks here. So you know, and just write it out and whatnot. It's kind of cool. I was gonna tell you talking about standards. Um, also had a chick on the show named Dawn Richardson. She's a great friend of mine out in San Francisco. She was the lead drummer for Four Non Blondes. Um, and is now in a band with uh, Jane Weedlin of the Go Go's and all mm-hmm. kinds of cool stuff. We do some Go Go's. Yeah. We do. Uh, we got the beat or vacation the or. Uh, four non blonde song. There. Yeah. That's what I was What's referring going to. On and yeah. So my girl Beverly McClellan, obviously, when she was on The Voice, Christina picked her. Her and Christina did a lot of work together, and Linda Perry wrote a lot of songs for for uh, Christina Aguilera as well as Pink, and you know now she's working with Dolly Parton and all kinds of cool stuff. But Bev got to go to to Linda Perry's studio and and record "Beautiful" with Christina Aguilera oh, with yeah. her. Yeah, well, Dawn had grown up playing with Linda. You know, they were big buds, and she's on every recording of... She is on What's Up. She's on the drummer on that. And uh, we ended up in a book together. She's also in the female documentary. Um, and we follow each other. They're all on my Facebook, you know, and paying attention and all this stuff. Anyway, I told her, I was like, you know that song? I was like, I consider it a standard nowadays because since it came out in the 90s, which I clearly remember it coming out, you know, I'm singing it to the top of my lungs, you cannot be in any cover band and not get a request for that song, you know. And me and Bev used to cover it all the time. Every every female band I've ever had over the years has covered that song. So I feel like it's the new Mustang Sally. It's the new Play That Funky Music, White Boy. You know, those are songs that just always will go over mm-hmm. in any club. It doesn't matter where you are. Um, I feel like What's Up is the new standard, you know, or has been since it came we out. We always get people singing along with that if... We do it. I mean, it's so. what three chords? Isn't it three chord? I mean, you, yeah, that's, yeah. See, that that's the kind of song I can play. <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, you know what? Most of our hits are G-A-D-C-C. three chords. 
something. I there's can't a, remember. There's a famous quote by Woody Guthrie, if you know who he is. He's a very famous musician. He says, if you play more than two or three chords, you're showing off. Or there's another one that says, if you play more than two or three chords, it's jazz. You know, so if you know C, A, and G, you're good. Yeah. You know. <laughs> I can play those. Heck yeah. I, I play quite play a. I can play some E and D every yeah. once in a while. I play a little mean rhythm guitar myself. So, yeah, I just love that. But I, I actually prefer piano. I love to play piano, and that's one of my favorite instruments. I mean. That's a regret that I have is not learning an instrument. Yeah. Well, at you a still young. Age. You still so, young. You can still yeah, do it. I teach. I play around on the guitar a little bit. I was like, I've got a guy right now who's in his 60s that's learning to play drums for the first time in his life, you know, yeah. and he's loving it. Yeah. Um, I get old and younger. I get a lot of younger kids, and uh, my teaching business generation studios is out the charts. I mean, I can't even take on any more students. I've got so many right now, but um, I always love it when I get those adult students that are like, I think I'm too old. I even dated a girl who, this is a great story, who said to me, you know, she was in her late 30s, going on 40s, and she said to me, you know, everybody in my family plays music, but they never, ever fostered music in me. And I said, well, you're not, you can still do that. So I got her lessons and found her a great, you know, bass player and teacher. And guess what? She's still playing around here in her own band. Nice. And she credits me for helping her, you know, and I said, you're welcome, you know. Yeah. So I don't think you're ever too old to learn an instrument. Yeah. I really don't. So you should take some lessons if you want. <laughs> you know, find well, you a good teacher or get, get you with your guys who I jam, do. you know. My uh, my boyfriend who bought me the guitar keeps pushing me to continue to play and he'll show me like Yeah. Some new chords every once in a while he still tries to get me to play the B chord. Yeah. So. Oh, yeah. That's Which that I'm bar like, chord. Eh, I don't need that. Remember what I, I say. Remember what I say. The yeah. bar chord, that first bar chord, that B, man. Mm-hmm. Once you learn that, everything else is going to be easier going down the fret because it's smaller. Yeah. 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 So it's the B is the one of the harder ones, as I've been told by very famous guitar players. You know. So anyway, I, I encourage you, Jay. I think it's awesome. Um, and I was just thinking about, you know, we've hit on a lot of different things. Um uh, do you see yourself in the future staying around Louisville since you've got, you know, you do a lot of the media stuff as well, um, as well as the plan. You've got two different groups going on. I mean, you know, what is your goal, I guess, for the future with the music? Is it to continually put out records and your own solo it is. work? I, I, sometimes I wonder, like, as I get older, am I still going to do this? And I think the truth of it is I can't see me not doing it. Right. Um I love to write. It's it's definitely, you know, I mentioned it's like a form of therapy, but it's it just kind of comes naturally. Yeah. And I'm always thinking of different things that I can write about and Yeah. Um That's awesome cuz I'm more of that type of artist myself. I like to just like I said, I'll be driving around and things I see on a daily, I'll take that as influence and put it into my original stuff and mm-hmm. I've got some really interesting things coming up. A song called Strange-O, um, you know, and just all kinds of really interesting things on my solo record stuff um, that I've just pulled from everyday instances. And I've gone back in my Bev, you know, I was left, I produced her for the last six years of her life, um, as well as Sue O'Reilly, who just, um, I keep saying O'Reilly, it's Sue Riley, um, who just passed. Um, she was my uh, bass player for the past 12 years in Ma'am Overboard, and we were in a band called She Groove and all kinds of different projects. We both uh, toured and played with the Troubadours of Divine Bliss, and she played with Robbie Bartlett. I mean, you know, she literally played with everybody. But looking back, I found all these recordings and productions that I we had started that we never finished, and I had put a lot of her work on Bev's stuff. So I went back and I've, you know, I found sound bites from Bev that I inserted on the record here and there. There's a real funny one that we started called Jesus Might Forgive Me But the South Never Will and it's about being gay, <laughs> you know, because I do feel like that Jesus would forgive us for being gay but the South will never, you know what I mean? So I had uh, some loops of Bev like singing that, went back and like I just love to like mash up stuff. Yeah. You know, I don't know if you were a big fan of uh, any of the earlier hip hop stuff, but like De La Soul, all those uh, earlier group, Grandmaster me, Flash. And I, yeah, I me, say. myself, and I. 40 Feet yeah. and Rising Man, that was a great record. And if you listen to it, that's back when like the Beastie Boys were coming out and really. Oh. You know, we we both lived through the invention of hip hop, which started with Grandmaster Flash's The Message when they actually did have a message in hip hop and rap. Uh, I feel like somewhere along the way they lost their message. 
somewhere after Tupac and all that, you know, because Tupac still had a message that he was talking about. True instances, he was writing his true life in his music. If you listen to Dear Mama, you're going to feel that heartfelt emotion that we want. We all need to get some sort of emotion out of our music. Because if we can't relate, why are we listening, you know? And music is a, it's a personal listening experience between the listener and the the writer, you know? So if you're listening to a track, you're not going to get out of it what I get out of it because it's a personal experience when you listen is the way I look at it. Exactly. Um, I don't like to explain, like, to, you know, I've, I've been to the singer-songwriter things in Nashville and someone will go on for three or four minutes before they and this isn't everybody yeah. i don't want to make it sound like i'm throwing everybody in a basket here but well nashville's a whole nother animal too yeah yeah but some of the singer songwriter you know open mic things we would go to somebody would spend three or four minutes talking about what their song is about and mm-hmm. why they wrote it and how they wrote it and all yeah. this stuff they love to do that but the truth is like now you've kind of uh prevented your listener from being able to create their own story from yeah, what they hear from I agree. It. So yeah. I don't... That didn't happen, by the way, until the songwriter... There was a video... There was a, a show on VH1 called... I think it was called Songwriters. Or it was like behind the stories. It was behind the yeah. music. Or, behind the music, yeah. And I mean, it's Where they talk about why they wrote your their songs. famous... Yeah. You know, your famous artist that the song's already popular mm-hmm. or whatever, and you are kind of excited to hear the yeah, story. Yeah, exactly. But when people don't know who you are and they've never heard the song before, it's <laughs> kind of like... I don't like a lot of banter yeah. at when we play a Mad Luck show. I like introducing the song. Mm-hmm. You know, I'll say this is about, uh, this is a love song. It's yeah. about a little crush I had on yeah. somebody. Or This is a song where I killed off the ex because I didn't like him anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or I'll, you know, I'll joke around about the Poltergeist song, but I won't yeah. get into what it's about. I kind yeah. of. You leave it up to the listener to give their own... Get their feeling out of it. Yeah, I feel you on that. In fact, a couple of songs that I loved. There was a song by Sarah McLaughlin called Building a Mystery. Yeah. Well, that's one of my favorite Sarah McLaughlin songs, and I just loved it. She dated her drummers, and, you know, and uh, she always had great drums and great lyrics and just heartfelt. I love that song for my own reasons, Uh, and, you know, then I watch her tell, oh, yeah, we were in the studio, and we just needed an extra song, so I wrote that in two minutes. It really has no meaning. Well, that ruined the whole damn song for me, you know what I'm saying? Exactly. (laughs) It ruined the whole damn song. I was like, I didn't want to know that. I I thought you had put all this thought and effort, and you were writing about somebody with voodoo dolls you know and yeah yeah, it was like no and nowadays because we have google we can look up lyrics because you know we come from the time period before the internet was around before social media was around before we even had cell phones with the internet there have been songs that i thought were so heartfelt and just pulled my heartstrings and then i read the lyrics and the lyrics are nothing like what i thought they were saying Uh, and then it changes the whole perspective we were um we decided we were going to do a song by the police like mm-hmm. we're gonna try it out this Sunday. Stuart we have Copeland a, represent. Heck yeah. heck yeah! We um are playing a brunch at Gerstle's this Sunday, and we were like, let's do a police song. And we we'd been looking through them. We tried a couple, but for some reason, King of Pain came up. Oh yeah, that's a great one. And I looked up the lyrics, and then I looked up, you know, it has the thing at the bottom where mm-hmm. it was showing people's interpretation of it. And it was talking about going through dark times mm-hmm. and depression and what Sting was going through when he wrote it. Mm-hmm. It made yeah, me like the song dark. that much more. Yeah. So it can have the opposite effect. But. Yeah, no kidding. Well, I tell you what, I love the police. They were one of my favorite bands, Stuart Copeland. I've studied a lot of his work. In fact, in my uh, studio right now, there's a huge police poster hanging up. Yeah, but after I read Stuart Copeland's book, his autobiography, I just, uh, Sting, I, I had a different mindset on Sting. Um, I've heard things. Yeah, I mean, they've been fighting for years. And I saw him in Bonnaroo uh, when they reunited. I also saw him up here at Churchill Downs when they reunited. And the first thing Sting comes out, it says is welcome to the Stuart Copeland show and everybody went boo and it was just like this it, that was the first thing he said you know what I mean and then they went on to play a show and in Stuart Copeland's book he claims that now keep in mind Stuart Copeland started the police and he's the one who found Sting and put him in the band so Sting kind of owes a lot to Copeland you know and he went on to do his solo career and whatnot but uh, Copeland says in that book that Sting will never look him in the eye on stage and he calls him Sting-O which is funny because I just took a took that idea and wrote a song called Strange-O 
about it, which yeah. I took influence from that book, which is kind of funny that we're talking about the police. But uh, I'm a big fan of all theirs. Stuart Copeland's a great drummer. He's an orchestra oh, dude. Yeah. I mean, he's just brilliant. Yeah. And the way that they started that band, he used to pretend to be somebody else and call into the radio stations and be like, can you play? You know, he'd send the songs in and then he would call and pretend to be like a fan. And he would Very write, smart. it's genius, and he would write to uh, the papers and be like, hey, this new band, this new band, and he would send all this stuff, and eventually that helped get them their big break. Hmm. And also another fun fact about him, because I'm a big fan, he was a videographer. He was big into video, and his brother was big into video, and because of him recording everything which i'm a big fan of i literally would wear a chess cam at all times it's rolling a live stream that's how i would love to roll and let people log in and watch my life because of that they it helped get their start it, a lot of their early videos were his handheld footage on his little you know eight millimeter video cam which is super rocking yeah. but i don't know if we'll ever see them back together again because i feel like they just are fighting too much yeah stings ego stings ego yeah and he's kind of dark and weird you know, There's if you've ever read anything about him, well, no, dark and weird's cool, but don't be dark, weird, and weird sexually and like strange. You know, you can't yeah, be that creepy weird. Yeah, it's hot, but well, I don't care. He's into some very odd things. <laughs> we'll say mm-hmm. that if you read anything upon him, but I do love his music. I do. His, yeah, uh, Sting solo, solo stuff. stuff yeah, much. yeah, but I love the one that you just dropped in, and most yeah. all of those old school um, police tracks still hold up. Yeah. yeah. Well, Andy, is there anything you want to add in before we have to finish up our little interview here? I've, it's, so, it's been so cool to have you in the LRS 102 studios. Thank you. Um, I didn't know a lot about you, but now I know a whole lot more, which I love. And I'll try to come check out your band and support and whatnot. Sweet. Love your solo record. Um, and thank you for my swag. She brought me t shirts and yeah. stickers and all kinds of. I love something Represent. free. Heck yeah, I will. I'm going to put it on my drum box um, and wear the t shirt soon. And I wish you all of the best of luck in your original writing because that's where I feel like artists succeed. I can tell you're a true artist if you've put out your own stuff. And yeah. this production is fantastic. That was uh, my first real album. So I'm, I'm pretty proud of it. It turned out exactly the way I wanted it Good. to. Hoping, you know, the second one breathes some new life. It's got uh, various influences on it, anywhere from Baruch Assault to... Cool. I mentioned Beck earlier. Mm-hmm. I, I can't even pinpoint anymore. Uh, it's all over the place. So uh, what I'm really hoping is when we come out with this and we've got the solid drummer on board with us, Nick, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, we can actually put some steam behind this. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, I'm going to encourage you to, to uh, take lessons on every instrument. I'm a big believer in music education. Obviously, music can change the world. I feel like mu- music is the universal source of the universe. It really is. And it's the healing force of the universe as well. You know, anytime we grieve, if we could just focus on music, it helps you get through those, you know. And I've also taught a lot of autistic children and stuff like that over the years and have seen it change lives. But. I'm a big believer in, you know, stu- you you want to be a master of your craft. You want to know how to read. You want to know how to write what you hear. You you want to be able to do every style. You want to be able to do theater, orchestra. You know, you want to branch out and just do all of that stuff as well as covers. Because this right here is what will set you apart. Because as I always say, you know, when you pass, this is what we're going to be tuning into. I'm going to be going back and going, hey. I'm listening to Mad Luck. That was that was really cool. You know, what more would somebody want when they pass on than you to listen to their music or play it on the radio? Exactly. You know what I mean? And it's not about being in it for money or any uh, anything other than it just I'm being therapeutic to yourself. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I wish you all the best and luck when you get the second record out whenever it happens. Please come okay. back in the studio. Yeah, and I'll let you do a little acoustic thing or something. And cool. uh, and in the meantime, we'll be we're gonna write a track. We're gonna let's do a rap track together. Because I think it'd be hilarious. It would be fun. Yeah, we'll come up with something cool because you, you kind of have a dark side to you, and I love a little darkness, you know. I'm a Christian, but I do love a little darkness up in there every now and then. So it's, it's what makes it fun. We love our artists when they're tormented. <laughs> we don't tend to love our artists when they're happy. What else you know are you going mean? to write about, you know? Exactly, exactly. So I, I thank you so much for being up in the studio. And, thank you uh, so much for having me. Coming it was good in getting and, to know you. Oh, yeah, man. Instead of just being 
social media friends. So. Yeah, we're social media friends, and I will remain that. I always love, uh, you know, I love my social media girl. I'm a social media whore. <laughs> oh, is whore a dirty word? It I don't know. It is. That's dirty. I, I think it's a great word. <laughs> Just my own <laughs> personal opinion. Just like bitch. I think bitch is a complimentary bitch term. I'm like, thank you so much for that. Word. I really appreciate it. Um, but yeah, I wish you all the best in luck, and thank you so much for being in on our studios. It's Andy Thanks, Ramser. Check out Mad Luck Sweeter now. Go check out her gig uh, at uh, Third Street Dive this weekend. There is no cover for that, we found out. So check that out, um, and you know, and just catch her around town doing all the groovy stuff that you do. I really appreciate you. Thank you. Appreciate you. Yeah, and we're gonna leave you with some Paramore because you like Paramore. Yeah. Tune in tomorrow, and as always, stay groovy.